So thanks a lot for this nice introduction. Uh, thanks for inviting me to give this talk here. This is, it's very exciting, not just because uh, EASY is a great place, but because I, I was first in this room 31 years ago for the analysis exercises, which I've learned many useful things. So it's, it's really, really, really great to, uh, to be back here. All right, um, so let us start. Um, I, I think you all know what is gravitational waves. Let's just uh, see a little visualization, which comes from a numerical simulation of the Einstein equations for binary black holes. To give you an impression what gravitational waves are, uh, here in, in three dimensions, we, you can see the, the distortions of space-time that, that, that are generated by the dynamics of the binary and they travel off at the speed of light, um, eventually to be measured and tell us information about what has created them. And the signal is strongest when these two black holes merge and, and ring down to some final stationary solution. Um, the, uh, the fact that the Gravitational waves exist, it's not a surprise. We have known this for, uh, for quite some time. Uh, there has been indirect uh, uh, evidence through the observation of pulsars in binary systems. Pulsars are neutron stars, so the stars at the uh, roughly a solar mass, one and a half solar masses at nuclear density, roughly the size of a city, uh, which may emit uh, radio pulses acting as very precise clocks. And uh, these pulses have been, this is very, very nice timing to have discovered exactly 50 years ago. Um, and when they are, when they act as very precise clocks in binary systems, this, this allows us to measure very, very precisely their orbits. And in particular, allows us to measure how these orbits change by losing energy due to gravitational waves. And the system where this happens has been discovered by Hals and Taylor, for which they got the Nobel Prize in 1993. And here you can see a very precise comparison of the measured data with the predictions from general relativity, which is um, why, since this time, we were quite certain that gravitational waves indeed do exist. However, it's much more interesting if we can directly observe them, because then we can, they can tell us, as a messenger, about the systems that, that generate them to understand what has created them, to understand these very exotic uh, systems, like black holes or neutron stars. Now, what, what uh, almost everything that we know about the universe, we know it from electromagnetic observations. And so an astronomical observation of electromagnetic waves is essentially the incoherent superposition of the waves from many, many atoms and molecules, many particles. And because of this incoherent superposition, we essentially lose uh, the phase observation and we just uh, measure intensity. Essentially, we measure intensity as a, as a function of angle and also the spectrum. And what this gives us is an image of the source, and we have many techniques to process these images. However, gravitational waves, they rather give us information about the bulk motion of the object. Okay? Um, so, for example, the motion of a binary system creates a coherent wave train, like what is suggested here, or here, how we would measure this in the detector. And so, in many ways, this is actually more analogous to hearing rather than seeing, because you have this wave that you record with all the phase information. And also, what is uh, interesting to note is because, you, you, uh, in this case, you measure amplitude rather than in intensity, the amplitude falls off like one over distance. And so, uh, if you increase your sensitivity, then your event rate increases essentially with a cube of the sensitivity. So if you have a tenfold sensitivity increase, you can see a thousand times more events, whereas for, uh, if you watch intensity, then it's just about a factor of 30. So, so, so if you make your instrument more sensitive, the, the gain is much, much bigger than with electromagnetic observations. And this has given the field the confidence that even if you haven't seen something for a long, long time, eventually you will see it because you just uh, make your instruments a little bit more sensitive and you have a lot more events. Um, what is the effect of gravitational waves on matter? Essentially, gravitational waves produce tidal forces on matter, like on our detector. Like in electromagnetism, there are two polarization states, but here they're rotated by 45 degrees. Let's see if we can move this. Yeah, so here we, are. So we see our two uh, polarization states, um, which stretch, uh, stretch and uh, compress matter periodically. But because of the, the extreme stiffness of space-time, it, it needs very, a lot of energy, huge masses at very large accelerations to create even the tiniest deformations. And that's why 
uh, only astronomical objects can create deformations in space-time that are large enough for us to measure. Um, there are, in principle, many, many, many possible sources that I will not have time to go to in, in detail, but I want to mention is that there's sources from uh, so relics, possible relics of inflation, to supermassive black holes, maybe cosmic strings, to various objects of stellar masses, which, which would span a very wide uh, frequency range, from very, very low frequencies, to roughly kilohertz frequencies, which would correspond to stellar objects. And the, uh, the smaller the mass, essentially the higher is the frequency, but the highest frequencies that we would expect uh, from stellar objects is about kilohertz. Now, so if you, if you apply this principle to a very large object like uh, the LIGO detectors, which have uh, four kilometer arm lengths, then uh, you can try to beat the extreme uh, uh, the extreme strain on the, um, on the measurement that is required. So if you make some rough calculations, what is the kind of uh, effect that you would expect from astromo astronomical sources? You can't really expect anything larger than a relative uh, change of the length of your detector by more than about 10 to the minus 21, which is about a change in distance from, from Mercury to the Sun by the size of hydrogen atom. So to try to measure this, Seems to be complete science fiction, but you can actually do this by, by laser interferometry. And so we have these two um, most accurate instruments, which are the two LIGO instruments in the US, which are, which are separated by about 3,000 kilometers, which corresponds to about 10 milliseconds light travel time. And we know for quite some time that we can indeed measure these very, very small strains of the detector, because, when you, because this is your detector output, um, essentially power spectral density or amplitude density as a function of frequency. Uh, and so you just measure your noise in the detector. You can indeed see that this is about 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 22, where you have your noise floor. So indeed, uh, people can measure these extremely, extremely tiny strains that you generate on the arms of your detector. And uh, indeed, these things have been built. So these are quite impressive things to see with, with, uh, if, you're, if you're at the end station. And in each direction, you see about uh, four kilometers to the other station. These are very, very large installations. The uh, sensitivity of gravitational wave detectors has uh, improved continuously. So what we see here is a comparison of uh, the uh, S6 LIGO science run in this light color. So this was the last science run which was performed in about uh, 2010 uh, with the initial LIGO detectors. Uh, but then uh, there has been an upgrade which took several years and in 2015 the advanced LIGO detectors became operational uh, and finally a new uh, science run, observation run 1 was performed which as you can see is significantly lower, uh, uh, significantly higher sensitivity, significantly lower noise level. In particular there's a huge improvement at low frequencies as I mentioned before. Um, so higher frequencies, lower masses, lower frequencies, higher masses. And so if you gain sensitivity at low frequencies, this means that heavy objects like black holes become much, much easier to find. And uh, this is what this looks like when you superimpose signals. So we here we again have this, uh, a picture of the noise in the detectors and then you superimposed the typical kind of signal and frequency that you will get from merging black holes of different masses. And so black holes with higher masses are more to the right black holes with lower masses more shifted to the left. Um, you don't just need detectors. You also need lots of people to analyze these, to, to develop and run different algorithms that find the signals in the data and that help you to identify what could have been the sources. And for this reason, the uh, LIGO scientific collaboration was established in 1997 under the leadership of Barry Barish, who got a Nobel Prize for this uh, last week. And, um, this has now about uh, more than 1,200 members, more than 100 institutions in 18 countries. And this little tiny dot in Mallorca, this is us. There's another uh, collaboration, the Virgo collaboration, which is a little bit smaller, um, which uh, is responsible for the Virgo instrument, which is near Pisa in Italy. And together they form the uh, LVC, the LIGO-Virgo collaboration, which analyzes all the data together. Um, LIGO-Virgo. Uh, science is uh, essentially open science. Um, you can get all data, eventually at least, uh, and for example, for all the discoveries, you can get an hour of data, 
around the event. You can download it. You can write papers with it. Uh, there's documentation, there are tutorials. Um, there's a lot of extra, for example, for all the papers. You will have all the data that you can download for all the plots. And also the code that is used for the analysis is open source. You can download the code. If you want, you, re you uh, can repeat the analysis yourself. The, not, not the full data is immediately open, but large enough chunks that you can do something useful. Um, in order to understand how these data are analyzed, let's look a little bit about what waveforms look like and what we can uh, do with them. So here you see an example waveform, maybe the waveform from the uh, coalescence of two black holes. And so as a, as a function of time, just uh, stylized here, First, uh, at low frequencies, at early times, is an in-spiral phase when these black holes or neutron stars are very far apart from each other. And, in, and when they are far apart from each other, their gravitational waves and their dynamics are well described by perturbation theory. It's called post-Newtonian uh, perturbation theory, which is essentially a power series in the velocity. Um, there's a, a variant for this, a very important uh, variant, which is called effective one body resummation, uh, but this is just... Uh, a side comment. However, when the frequencies get higher, when you get closer to the merger, when the distances get smaller, this uh, perturbation theory breaks down and you have to solve the full Einstein equations non-perturbatively, so that you have to do this numerically, and this field is called numerical relativity, the numerical solution of the Einstein equations. You have to do this for a few orbits, maybe at 5, 10, 20 orbits, uh, where this theory is not applicable. After the merger, the uh, ring down to a stationary state, to a curved black hole, is again described by perturbation theory and is characterized by certain ring down frequencies which you can kind of uh, compute analytically, at least once you know what is the final state. So what we usually do in order to compute a complete representation of a model is uh, we perform numerical simulations, we use uh, some black hole perturbation theory and we glue the signal together with the in spiral which is described by post theory. And then you have a description of your waveform and the way that you can perform the optimal analysis of your data is based on the matched filter method um, for which you need uh, waveform models which we call uh, signal templates. And what this basically is uh, mathematically is essentially if you have two waveforms, one of this would be the uh, model and another one would be the detector uh, recorded data, you, you uh, perform some kind of a uh, scalar product between them, which is weighted by the noise of the detector. Um, the, uh, and then the, the one which has essentially the, the largest value of the uh, scalar product is the one that fits the data best, and which is the one which is supposed to correspond to your source. Uh, explained in, in simpler terms, you can uh, compare this with uh, things like Shazam, uh, mobile apps, which if you don't know what some, you hear music in some cafe and you don't know what that is and you, you want to, to know, you just record it with your mobile phone, and it, it uh, compares the noisy data that you record in this cafe with a database which has all possible songs, or many songs. And then it will tell you what is the most likely song. And the basic idea is very similar, and in this case, the, the noisy music in the, in the cafe is the uh, data in the detector, and the database of songs is that what we have to compute from the Einstein equations, the thing that the catalog that we compare with. Another way, of visualizing this, you can see this here. Oops, this is not. This didn't work. Let me just make a minor transformation here. All right. So, <laughs> sorry. So what we see here is a signal buried in the data. So the data detector is very very noisy. There's a signal, and now we have a template, which is this uh, black thing, which we shift in time. Uh, and we compute this overlap integral. And when, they, when the time shift is right, we see a spike in what we call the signal-to-noise ratio, and we see evidence that indeed this kind of signal is present in the data. This is, this is the fundament of the data analysis, and if you go to the LIGO Open Science website, you can find some quite detailed tutorial which teach you the method, which tell you how to download uh, all the data, and you can go ahead and try to do some science with this yourself. So the only thing that you uh, need, and which may, you may not uh, find in a long time, is you actually have to have these kind of events happening in the universe. And one of the things that we don't know, or didn't know at all, what is the 
event rate of, for example, collisions of black holes, collisions of neutron stars in the universe because we just don't know enough astrophysics about the different formation scenarios. And uh, so there was, there was estimates from all kinds of astrophysical arguments, but these estimates used to have error bars of three or four orders of magnitude. So it was quite uncertain when would we make the first detection, and so it was quite surprising uh, that finally in uh, 14th of uh, uh, September 2015, we had a, a very, very strong signal that I will sh now play to you. So we'll see this in, as a function of time, and we'll see, we see the two detectors, and we see it both uh, a plot as a frequency, as a function of time, and the actual signal. So let's have a look at this. I will also see that we also hear the, uh, the signal. So you see the, uh, the time signal, the fre time frequency signal, and you hear the corresponding signal. The, uh, so you hear the noise of the detector, and on top of the noise, you hear the event, which is, it is not very uh, exciting. It's a bloop, and that's it, OK? It's, uh, it's a very short signal in time, just a few cycles, because in this case, the black hole is, is very massive. We just see, we can only see a few cycles that we have in the band of the detector. So this signal is consistent with the merger of two roughly 35 solar mass black holes with no or very small spin. It's a, it's a very loud, a very clear signal. It has a signal to noise ratio of 21, which is far more than one could have expected, and a, sig a statistical significance, which is uh, significantly above uh, five sigma, which was set as the uh, detection limit. This was announced 11th of February 2016, so after about five months of analysis. Uh, it was clear that there was a detection after about an hour, so this doesn't actually take very long. But um, all the science that you can do with it, finding out which is the system that fits best, doing things like testing the Einstein equations, all the, all the things that you can do, this led to about, I think, 12 or 13 companion papers, which were all published on that time, and this took a lot of time. This took five months. Um, so this was the, uh, a short impression of the, of the results of the first uh, observing run, which went uh, from, so officially went from September 12, uh, just before the, uh, the event happened, to mid-January 2016, and we found uh, one first clear event, a second event, in December, a Christmas present, and there was one week event, which is not confirmed, but people are quite uh, certain that it's actually a physical event, but the, uh, the, the signal to noise ratio was very uh, small. Uh, most, uh, what I want to talk about now is the results from the second observing run, which started in November 2016 and lasted until the end of August 2017. So in this run, first, in the first few months, we had two events. Which were, not, which were very exciting. You have a new detector, all kinds of things can go wrong. Uh, but uh, so the first event that was recorded was, uh, where well, we have the names so of GW170104. So 4th of January 2017 was the first discovery. Again, it's a signal that you can very clearly see in a time frequency uh, diagram. So here we have time, here you see that the, the frequency rises up. And the signal gets stronger as you get to the merger. It's what you physically expect. And here you see the, uh, the detector output from the two detectors. As a function of time, it's very noisy. And then in black, overlaid is a theoretically computed waveform, which, fits, uh, which reasonably fits the data. If you subtract the black theoretical curve from the data, you are left with just noise fluctuations, which are consistent with simply Gaussian noise of the right uh, of the right frequency. So we seem to have captured all of the signal with our theoretical model. Then uh, the second event that was detected in 02 was GW170608. So this was 8th of June. So we had to wait quite a number of months for the second event. Uh, but this was only published in uh, mid-November. It was, it was an interesting event. It was the, the lightest black hole binary so far observed of 19 solar masses. In fact, uh, the article was published in the journal uh, yesterday. Um, but we, had, we waited for quite some time until November because we were busy with other things that were judged more exciting. And so this was shifted to later. Uh, and in order to explain what uh, was more exciting, we have to talk about the advanced Virgo detector, which is in Kashina, which is uh, a village near to Pisa. It's a bit smaller 
then the LIGO detectors with three kilometer arms. Uh, it could be almost as sensitive. However, they had problems uh, in recent years with some of the components that broke. And so it has uh, a significantly lower sensitivity right now, but it's going to improve next year. So here we see, again, these pictures with sensitivity of different detectors. Uh, we see the two LIGO detectors, Hanford and Livingston. And then with not as good sensitivity in, in Lilla, you see the Virgo detector. So even if it's even though it's significantly less sensitive, it can improve the sky localization and also uh, allow to measure both polarization states. So the two LIGO detectors essentially have the same orientation. So this is because uh, having the same orientation can, can initially increase your confidence in actually having detected something. So that's a reasonable uh, decision. But if they have the same orientation, you can only measure one polarization state. Uh, Virgo has a different orientation, and so you can measure both. So that's physically, scientifically interesting. But also, if you have three detectors, you can do more accurate triangulation, and so you can tell much more accurately where the signal is. Uh, you use the, the two more accurate detectors, um, the two more sensitive detectors, to confirm that you have some detection, and then you use the other one to improve your sky localization. And so um, the advanced Virgo detector joined the uh, the uh, science run on 1st of August, if you remember, the, the science run was scheduled to finish on 25th, 25th of August, so really there wasn't much time. Uh, there was a lot of time pressure. It was a big success that the Virgo detector could join the observation run at all. Uh, if they see something, it would have been fine. And only two weeks later, they could make the first triple detection of a black hole binary, 50 solar masses, very, very similar to the first detection. Uh, not quite as loud, but uh, clearly seen in the time frequency diagrams and clearly seen in uh, the, the time domain. And here you have these SNR plots, which we showed before, uh, where this peak indicates that your template matches the signal. So you see that Livingston is more sensitive than this one. Uh, the Virgo peak is very, very small. So just because of the data in the Virgo detector, you could not uh, argue that you have found something. But once you're confident that you have found something, you can use this to increase your angular resolution and tell where the signal is. And uh, so this is how this improves. So here we see a picture of the sky. Uh, we have a large error bar if you just use the LIGO detectors. But with the Virgo detector, we can say much, much more accurately where the signal came from. Now, for black holes, it is not quite so important because they only emit gravitational waves. However, other sources may also emit neutrinos or different types of electromagnetic waves and allow us, may allow us to do what is called multi-messenger astronomy, where we observe some source in different bands. So for this purpose, the LIGO-Virgo collaboration has signed memorandums of understanding with 92 partners from many different countries, uh, 70 observatories which uh, watch out, uh, watch the sky with 200 instruments ready to follow up on a LIGO detection when it happens. And they have memorandums of understanding that immediately if LIGO has detected something, they will be notified and they can start their follow-up campaigns. One of the things that would be very, very interesting to see is gravitational waves of supernovae. We have seen supernovae before with electromagnetic waves, but gravitational wave signals could help us to look what is going on inside the explosion and help us understand much better the physics of a supernova. And the other thing, uh, one of the other main sources that people are interested in is short gamma ray bursts. So short gamma ray bursts are uh, a very energetic uh, explosion that are isotropic in the sky. And uh, the uh, predominant theory of what causes them was that it's the collision of two neutron stars. But it was also quite clear to astrophysicists that we wouldn't be able to tell for sure unless we see them in gravitational waves. So um, I just want to, want, to, want to give you the back story. So, so I was uh, at, a, at a conference in Amsterdam uh, about the future of uh, gravitational wave science. And so on the taxi to the airport, I was bored because there was a traffic jam. So I checked my email. And I saw that they had made another detection. And it really looked like it was neutron stars. And so I was basically, until really, really, you had to switch off your mobile phone in the plane, just waiting for whether they have the first plots. And so just before the plane started, I saw the plot that will come here, which is the gravitational wave signal. Um, then uh, there was also an alert from Fermi 
Fermi is a satellite which uh, detects gamma rays, and it's the, the prime instrument which detects uh, gamma ray bursts. And when they make a detection, they immediately send out an alert for other astronomers to follow up. So they sent, so, so they made a detection um, uh, the 17th of August uh, in the early afternoon in Europe, and they immediately sent out the alert, and there was a LIGO signal single detected just two seconds before this, um, and it took about six minutes to detect it in the data to run the analysis, and it took quite uh, some more time, so about a half an hour to actually send out the alert because there was some problem with the data, which we'll see now. And then after this, uh, an extensive follow-up campaign started within minutes, which is probably the most uh, impressive uh, scientific uh, operation I think this has ever been uh, conducted, which eventually led to a paper with more than 4,000 authors uh, from many, many, many different uh, collaborations. And, and uh, let's first see this, uh, this signal that was uh, Sane. So this is the gravitation wave signal that we hear and we see. So this is very, very loud, very clear signal. And so here is the uh, optical counterpart, so gamma ray counterpart two seconds later. Um, and so from there, so the next thing that people wanted to find was uh, something which is in optical. Um, the, uh, so I want to show you this, this thing first. Um, which, is the actual, which is the actual data which the LIGO Livingston detector recorded. It has this huge spike. So this is, a, this is what is called a glitch. It's an instrumental failure which creates a very, very large uh, signal which is not, which is not the gravitational waves. And so this uh, confused initially the analysis, so people had to look at this before they sent out an alert. Um, the, uh, the science in the end was done with this clean data, so people modeled this subtracted it from the data, and that in, then they did the clean science after this. This was the first time ever that this was performed. And uh, so here's a, here's a little overview of uh, how the story unfolded. So there was the initial, there was the initial detection. And so all this story is described in this uh, paper with, I think, 4,500 authors. Uh, one of the main organizers of writing this paper and bringing all these people together was named uh, one of the 10 most influential uh, scientists of the year, yesterday by nature, which I, I think is very fitting. And this was an incredible, absolutely incredible thing to watch, just for, not just from the science perspective, but from the politics. Um, it took, uh, so it took two months to get this uh, discovery paper out. Um, remember that previous uh, discoveries took about five months to analyze. Here we did it in two months. We did uh, discovery of the first uh, binary neutral star, and the first triple detection. This was uh, uh, seemingly completely impossible to do this, but it was necessary because if we wouldn't have done this, the astronomers would have gone alone, was gone ahead and write their own papers. And so it was necessary to keep everybody together, which many, many points in time it didn't look like this was possible, but they actually, they actually pulled this off. Very, very, very impressive. And so we have uh, the initial gravitational observation, then two seconds later, uh, a gamma ray burst was detected. About 11 hours later, uh, there was an optical counterpart, which was identified in this galaxy NGC 4993. Um, identifying an optical counterparts is also complicated because there, there are some instruments which are better for this, but of course they can only see things when it's night. So for example, this was detected uh, first in Chile, just when it became night, and they couldn't detect it earlier because there was too much light. So they had to wait a little bit. Then a bit later, they observed uh, infrared, uh, a little bit later ultraviolet after nine days x-rays, and after two days uh, radio emission. So they observed this in every possible electromagnetic band. Um, one of the uh, things we'll uh, see afterwards in a, in a movie is, uh, is um, um, a phenomenon, phenomenon which is called kilonova. This is when the two neutron stars collide, lots of neutron-rich material gets ejected. So very dense uh, neutron-rich material, which is highly radioactive. Uh, the radi radioactivity uh, is what uh, creates lots of electromagnetic waves, which we can observe. But also, new elements are forged in this, uh, in this, in this highly uh, in this dense cloud of radioactive material, and the most prominent one being gold. Gold and other high, you know, um, uh, massive uh, 
elements are predominantly forged in uh, such collisions of neutral stars. There are other elements more in uh, supernova explosions, but uh, gold, uranium, and others, uh, whatever, when we have something <laughs> with gold, this is, this is where it comes from, the, the collision of two neutral stars. Okay. Um, just to give an impression of how lucky we were, the current estimate uh, for these rates, once we have upgraded the detectors, is between 0.1 and 1.4 per year for the next observing run and similar numbers at design sensitivity. So this is really not going to happen very often. It was really, really, really lucky. Okay. Um, this is the sky localization. So here we see the sky localization from LIGO detectors, from LIGO plus Virgo detectors. You see this is much, much, much more accurate. And this is the one from the uh, Fermi satellite, which is not as accurate. So the LIGO detectors were really necessary to tell the optical telescopes where to look. And these are the first uh, uh, identifications of uh, counterparts. This is the counterpart in this galaxy NGC 4993. And so once this was found, many other instruments then were able to also identify the optical counterpart and follow it up for the next days. Um, and so this is now a visual impression of this story. From, from the Inspiral to the uh, Kilonova and the Yeah, it has a very anticlimactic finish. So, so you, you see this, uh, what looks like a flower. So this is this kilonova when a lot of material gets ejected. Uh, and then here you see this shock where uh, radio waves are, are emitted. Um, right, no? No, I don't want to jump. All right, OK. So let's look a little bit about the, at the scientific results. Um, so one of the first things that you're interested in is what were the masses of these objects. And so we'll see now a few of plots of this kind of style. So these are Bayesian posterior distributions, in this case, of the component masses. And you can see there are two results here, red and blue. So this is the overall distribution, and then projected to mass 2 and mass 1. You can see these are roughly the kind of masses that correspond to neutral stars, roughly 1.5 solar masses. However, there's a degeneracy uh, for the waveform between the effects of mass ratio and spin. That's why they have this very long uh, needle-like structure. And you don't know whether the waveform effects come from mass ratio or from spin. But, but uh, neutral stars, they can, in fact, not spin very high. Because if they would spin more, they would just fly apart. And so if you assume the kind of spin that neutral stars can have, you get a much more, which means that you change um, to the appropriate prior, you get a much more uh, confined result. And you get pretty much 1.5 solar masses which is the typical thing that you expect for neutron stars. Uh, so now with this, we can see a, a diagram like this, which is the, the masses in the, in the stellar graveyard. So we have here uh, black holes. I, this cannot be seen very well. So here we have see the mass. So the, uh, in blue, we see all the masses from, blue, from uh, black holes, which have been discovered by LIGO and Virgo, which is nice we, we, uh, because for every merger, you have three black holes, so we're catching up very fast. The, the violet ones are all the... Uh, black holes which have discovered, been discovered in X-ray uh, X binaries. And here we see no neutron stars. And here there are now the, the uh, two uh, neutron stars which we have observed to merge. Um, one of the most uh, desired and most interesting results is not just, for example, the masses of these neutron stars, but we want to understand the equation of state. Because uh, so the equation of state, in principle, it's uh, described by nuclear physics. However, it's not practical to derive it from first principles. So we can only, uh, and the densities are much, much higher than what we can achieve in the laboratory. So the only way to understand that, that the uh, equation of state of neutral stars is to measure it in these kind of uh, observations. And so the, uh, the dominant effect of the equation of state is that um, the, these neutral stars can deform in the binary and they change the quadrupole moment. And so the, the quadrupole moment which, uh, of the neutral stars it changes the gravitational wave phase, which is this quantity psi here. So the change in this uh, quantity depends on a quantity lambda 1 and lambda 2, which are called love numbers. And these uh, numbers describe how 
deformed these neutron stars are. So this is what you want to measure from the INSPIRO, and these are the results. So this is a kind of crowded picture. These are the uh, deformations of the two neutron stars uh, measured. And so here we see 50% and 90% uh, posterior lines. And so we see here that it's quite dense uh, here. So this, so this is uh, so the or near the origin of this plot is where the most probable result lies. lies. And here we have seen some standard neutron star equations of state, which people have computed in nuclear physics. And so we see that so this, this region is uh, low compactness, and this region is high compactness. And there's a, a general high spin variant of this, in one way you assume that the neutron stars have low spin. And so we see that uh, these results strongly constrain more compact uh, neutron stars. So this is the first uh, observational result of this type for the equation of state of neutron stars. Um, this uh, merger of uh, two neutron stars is not just the start of multi-messenger astronomy, it's also the start of gravitational wave cosmology, because we were also able to do uh, cosmology. And the way that uh, this works is that you can use uh, neutron star mergers as a standard siren as opposed to a standard candle. So you know once you understand what was the source, you can compute how loud, how strong the gravitational wave amplitude will be. And this allows you to measure the distance. So measuring the distance from the gravitational wave signal and the redshift from identifying the host galaxy, you can infer a value for the Hubble constant, which is just the uh, relation between distance and redshift. And so we get this kind of result. And we compare this with other standard results. So here we see uh, this is the result for the Hubble constant from the Planck satellite mission. This is from um, uh, S1A supernovae which are not, they're not completely consistent. And so this is a quite broad uh, distribution result from gravitational waves. So at the moment, this is not accurate enough to distinguish between these two results, which are in, in tension. However, uh, one thing is important is that this uh, is a, a simple result, which doesn't uh, use any previous distance ladders. So it's a much, much simpler result. And in the future, with better, with more and better um, observations, it will also become much more accurate. Uh, so this, this opens the, uh, the door for future applications in cosmology of gravitational wave observations. Now, uh, I want to say a little bit about, uh, so now I've told you about some results. Now I want to tell you what uh, this has to do with me, but, but in, with Vienna in general. And so it turns out that there are several uh, former students uh, from, the, from the University of Vienna, which uh, have been involved in developing the, the waveform models that are used in the analysis that are used to identify uh, these sources. There are currently two main, uh, main models, main branches of development which are undertaken, where Rami and Patricia have uh, worked on, on one of them, and, and Michael has worked uh, on both of them. In fact, he, uh, he were first worked on, 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 on the one that uh, we were working on. Then he, worked on, then he helped uh, the other one. He saved their ass to, uh, to make it work out. So a large, uh, there are many other people working on this, but I think it's fair to say that uh, people from Vienna have had a quite an influence on developing the models and getting them ready for the analysis that has been performed. All right. Now, having that said, <laughs> let's look a little bit about um, some more of these plots, some more of these results. Uh, so, from somewhere here, we see results from the, uh, the June event, which was the lightest binary so far. And so we can see here this, this kind of uh, Bayesian posteriors for the total mass, for example, which is quite a sharp a sharp peak, or for the component masses. We see this kind of banana shape, which we saw even much finer, much thinner for the binary neutron star. We see it from, for this event, and we see it for the Christmas event, 2015. So we see that this one is, has lower masses than previous ones. And the other thing that I want to point out, so we see here uh, that different models have been used. So there's one which is called effective precession or non-processing. and so. There are different waveform models which do or not do model spin precession in the binary. And so the, one that, the only one that has this uh, precession is the one that we have provided. Uh, in this case, it pretty much gives the same result. But this was a, an important step that you have, uh, that you're able to, to basically model all the physics that ha can happen here. And that you uh, have waveform models which are very fast and efficient to evaluate in a computer. So this uh, Bayesian Markov chain Monte Carlo calculations, they're computationally very expensive. They run for many weeks, and so you need waveform models that are very hard to evaluate. You have to evaluate them millions of times 
so you can actually do this analysis in a reasonable time, like in three or four months, okay? And so this was, this was uh, one of the important input that all these uh, previous people have contributed to actually make this possible. Uh, here we see um, a very busy, very complicated plot about the spins. So we have two objects, so we have six spin components, and we cannot disentangle all these spin components. The, the maximum that we can do uh, for the moment is we can uh, measure the spin, the total spin relative, uh, so in the, in the direction orthogonal to the orbital plane, so parallel to the angular momentum, and this spin tells us how fast this uh, binary moves together. So this is this one here, and we can see that this is it's quite well constrained. Uh, it's, it, it might be zero or small and positive, so this is pretty well constrained. And then there's another one, this is the spin component in the orbital plane, which is responsible for precession, spin precession, and we see that this is essentially not constrained at all. So one of the great challenges for modeling um, black hole binaries in particular is to uh, be able to tell apart whether there is spin precession or not, which it will benefit from more observations, but mostly it will benefit from having a more accurate description of these waveforms. Um, the, uh, this is the January event. And uh, this, these plots look very similar. Here we, we see this uh, compared with the previous events that we have seen. So we see this is right in the middle uh, as far as the masses are concerned. But it had something interesting, namely the uh, spin uh, out of the orbital plane that seems to be pretty well constrained to negative values, which means that at least one of the, one of the black holes seems to have um, a sin, uh, um, or, um, rotation which is opposite to the orbital rotation. And that may be an important clue regarding the formation channel of these systems. However, we have to see more of these systems to really distinguish different populations to understand how these objects have been formed. Um, now, I want to very, very briefly talk about the waveform modeling, which uh, for, for me and other people uh, that come from Vienna has started with the problem of numerical relativity solving the Einstein equations on, on a computer. And this also has been a very hard and long problem that takes, it take, took basically four decades to solve. People started this in the, uh, in the 60s, but not until 2005 was, uh, was it possible to have the first very inaccurate, very short evolutions of a binary black hole system. And essentially, what happened since then, in the 10 years since then, we just got ready to understand black hole waveforms and dynamics just well enough just well enough to understand the first uh, binary black hole detection in 2015. Now, I want to show you a, a little movie of this, what the simulations look like. There's some artifacts here sometimes, but this shouldn't uh, disturb you. So these are some quite expensive mesh refinement simulations. The quantity that we see here is uh, the curvature component that corresponds to the outgoing gravitational wave. So here we have the two black holes orbiting each, each other with a very high curvature in the innermost region. And as they spiral together, more and more stronger and stronger waves get uh, created. Very sharp features have to be resolved. And finally, they merge and, and uh, radiate lots of gravitational waves. Now we're going to zoom out to really see what is the scale of the simulation and see how far we had to go out and many different levels of refinement. Uh, to be able to do the simulation. Now, let's see. It doesn't, it doesn't come out very well on the screen. I think it's the resolution, but I think you get an impression. All right, so now you see that the, the actual, the zone where things were going on was just this small part, but we had to uh, um, do a lot of mesh refinement to be able to do this in an accurate way. All right. Um, I just I want, wanted to show this because this is the Erwin Schrödinger Institute. There's mathematical physics, and there's a lot of mathematical physics that uh, is required to understand these uh, to understand these solutions, to understand why things work. There are interesting things about uh, the Schwarzschild solution, about the Kerr solution. I just want to flash this up for a moment, uh, just just to tell you that uh, these things happen and and move on. So one of the one of the other things that we have contributed to was to deal with precession. So if uh, the spins of the black holes, they are orthogonal to the orbital plane, the orbital plane is preserved, and you have a three-dimensional parameter space, and things look kind of boring. There's not much going on. 
and the gravitational wave signal is, um, looks rather simple. But if, you're, if these spins are not orthogonal to the orbital plane, they have a component in the plane, they create a very complicated precessing motion, which also leads to a very complicated uh, gravitational wave signal. And so, so here you have a, a full <coughs> seven-dimensional parameter space. If you have eccentricity, there are even two more parameters. And so for people that try to develop waveform models, this was quite discouraging. Because things are very complicated. There's a large dimensional parameter space. Things are very complicated. It did not seem feasible within just a few years to come up with an accurate uh, description of the persisting motion and persisting waveforms of binary black holes. However, what we could do was uh, to really simplify the problem very drastically. Um, so GR is, is complicated, but sometimes you can do things very simple. And so what we realized that is essentially because the orbital time scale is much, much smaller than the precession time scale, and gravitational waves are created by accelerating masses, the acceleration which is due to the precession motion is much, much smaller than the acceleration which is due to the orbital motion. And so for the energy balance and for the gravitational wave, waves that are emitted, the precession is just not very important. The precession just tilts around, twists around the system, shakes it around, but if you would go to a co-rotating frame, that, would, that effect would basically go away. And so what we could show that indeed, if you, even if you don't do it very accurately, you transform your system to a co-rotating frame, then your system just looks like one that is not precessing. And this is the trick which has made it possible in a, in a very short time scale to describe precession with reasonable accuracy that we can use it in data analysis. Uh, if, you, if, you, um, if you want to uh, have a short description of what the approach was to, to make this work, to solve this um, very complicated problem that seemed quite intractable, is in, 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 I think I can only say it in Viennese, it's we have been schmee angepackt, okay? So uh, really drastically simplified, and this actually worked out fine. And uh, um, so one of the things that keeps us mostly busy, so because you, you reduce your processing, your very complicated processing motion to one that is not processing, now you have to describe this non-processing motion very, very accurately, which is what we spend most of our times on. I'm on. And then there's another problem which is kind of related, which is that gravitational wave signals that are dominated, dominated by the quadrupole harmonic, by the quadrupole spherical harmonic. But there are other spherical harmonics also which increase a lot the complexity. And so essentially what we have been doing, what we've been doing this year, and, and uh, yeah, this year, is to, is to find a trick which is very similar to how we treated precession, again, use simple arguments of perturbation theory and, and other physical insight to come up with a simple analytic prescription that gives you a mapping from the quadrupole mode to the full signal, which again, you can use to include a lot more physics in your, in your model and then do things like this, which is uh, simulated, uh, simulated um, events. Over here, this is the, the, the distribution that you get for the inclination. So you can, you, can, you can much more accurately say what the inclination is relative to a model which doesn't have these higher modes. And if you know what the inclination is of the system, then you can also much more accurately determine what is the distance, uh, which you can then use for other things to determine them more and more accurately. All right. Um, there is, all of, all of what I've said was about solutions that correspond to GR, waveforms that correspond to general relativity but you would also like to test with these observations whether general relativity is the correct theory in the first place, okay? And so I just want to give you a brief uh, executive summary. Uh, the strongest field test of GR uh, before the first uh, detection of, of binary black holes was, the, was this binary pulsar, which has a coalescence time of about 85 million years. So this binary neutral star system will coalesce in about this time. Whereas the coalescence time that we observed for the first gravitational wave event was 200 milliseconds. So this tells you how much stronger, the, uh, how much stronger, how much more dynamic the system is. Um, of course, this is, this is also a very good test of GR. It's just in a different regime where you can observe these neutron stars for a very long time, for many, many years. You get a very, very precise test. It's just not in the same regime of strong fields that you can do with gravitational waves. A lot of tests have been performed. No inconsistencies with general relativity have been found 
so far. With the, uh, now that we have the Virgo instrument up, we can also constrain the polarization. When Virgo becomes more accurate, we'll be able to do this much, much better. We have gotten very accurate results on the graviton mass. With the optical counterpart of the neutron stars, we have now very accurate results for the speed of gravitational waves relative to electromagnetic waves. And there's lots of, um, there's lots of other results about testing GR, testing parameterized tests and so on, which I, I think I want to skip uh, in the, in, uh, for time. I'm not going to this uh, in much more detail. So let's, let's skip a little bit about uh, testing GR, as nice as it is. Oops, all right. And just have a, let's have a brief uh, look to the future. So first, uh, new gravitational wave detectors will be coming online. So there are the two LIGO detectors. There's the Vigo detector. There's the GEO detector in Germany, which is much smaller, less sensitive, and mainly for testing. There is a planned detector in Vigo, which will come online in the early uh, 2020s. And there is a planned detector in, in Japan, which in fact is it's, uh, operational already, but at very low sensitivity. But this will have high sensitivity in just a few years. So then we'll have a very, uh, a very accurate um, network of uh, one, two, three, five detectors, which will give us much more, much better resolution in the sky. Uh, this is the projected, so projected sensitivity development and the project, projected uh, observation time. So we've gone through O1, we've gone through O2. So in about a year from now, we'll do the third science run, which is a significant improvement in sensitivity. Hopefully, possibly tens of events uh, of binary black holes will be detected. Then there will be another break of a half a year or so, maybe a bit longer, and then we'll start to operate at the science sensitivity, possibly detecting binary black holes every few days. Um, looking further in the future, there is now a very, very big project uh, called in Europe the Einstein Telescope, which is a, a third generation detector. Um, this, this will be something extremely expensive. So apart from the technology, technological challenge, the main thing is to, the main challenge is to create the, uh, the required uh, community in Europe and the required cooperation with the US to actually make such a project feasible on the time scale of 10 or 20 years, roughly on the same time scale that is required for the ELISA detector, which is a gravitational wave detector in space, with much, much longer arms, much lower frequencies that will allow us to observe supermassive black holes. This has been scheduled for launch in the early 2030s by the European Space Agency and uh, will allow us to understand things like how supermassive black holes formed, will allow us to do precision tests of uh, the black hole geometry by, by observing how much lighter objects spend many, many orbits in the black hole geometry and possibly and that would be the, the biggest, I think, holy grail of, of gravitational wave science is maybe see some, some signals from inflation from very, very early times in the universe. And now with this, I want to switch to something completely different uh, as a final. So, so we actually have, we have an Erasmus program with, uh, with Vienna, an exchange pro program, which has been going very, very well. I've sent students here now basically every year, and it has been a, a life changer from them to see uh, to see uh, how this university works, and they, they like it very much, I have to say. So thank you for this. Uh, but also, people can come if, in, if they want in the other direction. Which for undergraduates, I wouldn't recommend, but you can come for graduate studies. And so, uh, visuals are not very great. So if, if you come and visit us as an Erasmus student, um, the probability that you just make it into a Nobel Prize celebration, which you can see here, not very well, are small. Uh, also small, but a little bit higher because there's a lot of media interest in Spain is that you will have actually journalists looking over your shoulder while you work. This was uh, the last time happened this last, last week. We had to put up a half a day of show just for, for people. Uh, but, but if you come, what, what is uh, certainly, uh, will certainly happen that we invite you to one of our pizza nights and uh, you can meet the whole group and celebrate with them. And so with this, I want to thank you. I apologize for drawing over time. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.